the Leon Panetta 2024 Lecture Series. 2024 and the challenges to democracy at home and abroad. This lecture discusses the challenge of artificial intelligence, a threat or a blessing to humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sylvia Panetta. Good evening, everyone. These days, I can't see without my glasses. Good evening, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you back to the Leon Panetta Lecture Series live here in Leon's hometown of Monterey at the Monterey Conference Center. Incredibly, this is our 27th year of the lecture series. <laughs> Time does fly. For more than a quarter of a century, our community has come together to discuss the critical issues that affect our nation and our world. In particular, we believe it's important in our democracy to listen to different points of view in order to find the consensus that is essential to governing. Leon and I are proud that this community continues to support these important programs and allows us to bring them live to the audience here tonight. To those watching at home, and to the students who joined us this afternoon. Incidentally, we had a wonderful turnout. We have a wonderful series of topics and speakers for this year's season as we consider 2024 and the challenges to democracy at home and abroad. Tonight, we consider the challenge of artificial intelligence and ask whether this new technology is a threat or a blessing to humanity. Although there is no uniformly agreed upon definition for artificial intelligence, or AI, the term generally refers to machines that have access to huge amounts of data and can analyze that data at an incredible speed and provide answers that can help in decision making. Today, AI is involved in almost every sector of human life. The increasing penetration of AI is changing decision making within organizations and improving efficiency. At the same time, these developments raise important policy, regulatory, and ethical issues. What are the best applications for this remarkable technology? Where are the dangers and the potential threats? Who should be in charge of regulating this powerful new resource? How do we ensure transparency? How do we prevent prejudice? How can we legislate a technology that is so rapidly changing? Will AI help democracy or threaten its existence? Our first guest served as Virginia's Secretary of Technology from 2006 to 2009. He was then named by President Obama as the first U.S. Chief Technology Officer serving in that office until 2012. He wrote about his public service in his book entitled Innovative State, How New Technologies Can Transform Government. In 2011, he was named to Modern Healthcare's list of the, quote, 100 most influential people in healthcare. And in 2008, he was named to Government Technology Magazine's top 25 as their doers, dreamers, and drivers issue. He earned his MA in public policy from Harvard Kennedy School in 1997 and his BA from the Johns Hopkins University in 94. So please welcome Anish Chopra. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Hi, everyone.
Our second guest is a computer scientist, director of the Social Intelligence Lab, and a professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland, College Park. Her research focuses on analyzing and computing with social media and creating usable privacy and security systems. She writes for Slate and The Atlantic and frequently appears on NPR. Her TED Talk was named one of the most powerful talks of 2014. She received a BA degree in economics and a BS degree and an MS degree in computer science at the University of Chicago, as well as a PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland, College Park. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer Goldbeck. Our third guest is an associate professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, where he studies and teaches innovations and entrepreneurship and examines the effects of artificial intelligence on work and on education. He also leads Wharton Interactive, an effort to democratize education using games, simulations, and AI. His research has been covered by CNN, The New York Times, and other leading publications. He received his PhD and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management and his bachelor's from Harvard University. Please welcome Ethan Mollick. Our final guest is a four-star admiral with 37 years of service, including leadership roles as the director of the National Security Agency and the commander of U.S. Cyber Command. An experienced cybersecurity practitioner and policymaker, he worked across all three branches of the U.S. government to develop and implement cyber solutions and execute intelligence and cyber operations. He partnered particularly closely with the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, Department of State, the Congress, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and the U.S. and global intelligence community, as well as foreign, civilian, and military cyber organizations. So please welcome Admiral Mike Rogers. And of course, Moderating our discussion is the man who created this lecture series, the former United States representative for this district and the former director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense. He has seen how this technology has developed and how it can be a blessing or a threat to democracy. Please welcome Secretary Leon Panetta. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of our lec Panetta Lecture Series this year. Our theme is 2024 and the challenges to democracy at home and abroad. Look, the basic concept of democracy is that the people should be free to determine how to govern themselves. That concept is now under threat around the world and here from tyrants, from dictators, from demagogues, from terrorists, and yes, from those few who are elected in Washington who fail to govern. Added to this is now a wave of new technology. 
And we're not sure whether that technology is a blessing or whether it's a threat to humanity. At the top of that list is the subject we talk about tonight, artificial intelligence. Look, the story of human history is the story of new discoveries, of inventions, of theories, of innovations that have really changed our way of life. From the printing press, to the automobile, to nuclear weapons, to the computer. Some making life better, and some threatening life itself. And so it is with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is transforming almost every aspect of life, from health to travel to information to national security. Some call it merely a tool, another tool, but it is a tool that can make life better or ultimately control life itself. These are some of the most profound questions that I think we've ever explored in these lectures. And I'm happy to explore them with a very outstanding panel of speakers tonight. Let me begin by a basic question. What the hell is artificial intelligence? <laughs> you know, for the average person is not that familiar with it, but uh, at a recent conference, they had 1,500 senior business leaders were asked about AI, and only 17% were familiar, really familiar, with, uh, with AI. I'm sure that number goes up as artificial intelligence improves, but how would you define artificial intelligence to the average citizen? Maybe I'll start to get this discussion uh, rolling, and I'll begin where you left off on the topic of it's a tool. And to give context, it's a tool that takes vast amounts of data for the purposes of helping to predict whether it be a word or an item or a suggestion that you're looking to see answered or predicted. To make it real for all of us, many of us use Netflix at home, and each time we're interacting to select a movie, to start one but not finish it, to browse, all of that generates data. We may not realize it, but in the background, all of that information is uh, collected and then used to provide that recommendations engine that tells us, we think you might pr prefer this movie next. And that delight you feel that it's actually reasonable to discover content you'd never heard of before but works for you is the output of, of uh, AI. One further comment on the issue of what the definition is, up until November of 2022, companies that had their own data sets would use these tools on their own uh, systems to make a difference. That changed with the release of ChatGPT. A new class of systems are trained on the internet. Without us having to load any data into these systems, it's already been pre-trained to be able to help us answer questions. And it does so by predicting the next word in the response to a question that we prompt. So if I can add on to that as a computer scientist who builds AI, I think that's all <laughs> correct. Uh, but to kind of get a little more into the technical weeds of it, the way that we do any of this, whether it's Netflix, whether it's ChatGPT, whether it's a search engine helping you find something, is that there's some particular question that you want to answer. So what is the movie that you want to watch next? What is the word that comes next? But the amount of data that you need to really make that work is massive. Usually we're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions, or if you're talking on social media, literally billions of examples of other people who have made those decisions, what did they do, and how do we guess what comes next? And that's essentially what artificial intelligence is, a program that guesses what's come next based on the 
thousands or millions of examples that it's seen before. And I think that pushes on a really critical issue, which is if we're talking about people, that means we need a ton of data about people. If we're talking about systems, we need lots of data about that too. And we have that now, uh, but I think a big question that we'll come back to a lot today is how do we get that and how do we get it in an ethical way and what else is in there that's gonna impact what the system's guess comes next. Ethan? All right, so I'll add one layer of weirdness to this, okay? So everything everyone said is obviously right. We have real experts here that, that what these systems do is predict the next word in a sentence or next token or part of word in a sentence. Some, so it's fancy autocomplete, right? This is the autocomplete on your phone, except trained on the entire internet and very, very good. Somehow out of that, we have a system that seems to be creative, that appears to people that it's thinking, even though it isn't, that can produce a sonnet on demand or a story or an analysis or a business idea. We don't have 100% certainty about why it's so good. Also, why it lies so much is another thing we'll talk about more about. But the capabilities of these systems is very unclear, even to the people who create it. So I talk to OpenAI and companies like that on a regular basis. No one has, there's no secret instruction manual out there someone has. A lot of this is us all discovering what a system, uh, artificial intelligence system, training the entire internet and everything else we've written knows. And we're still learning that as we go. So there is a little bit of mystery here, even though technically we know how this operates. And for me, hey, I'm the military guy and my culture that you're trained in is always keep it simple, stupid. So to me, artificial intelligence is the ability of machines to independently achieve the traits of human intelligence, learning, reasoning, creativity, prediction. So, I mean, to kind of take what your definition, it, this is a, a lot of data, huge amount of data, right? That's part of this. And then there's a capability to almost uh, immediately analyze whatever question you direct to it, so it can analyze quickly and comes forward with, a, with an answer that either helps you in decision making or what? operates on its own, that's AI. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the independent. So <laughs> what, was, what was the breakthrough that created AI? And I, I did a little history here. In 1936, uh, the English mathematician Alan Turing, who I think broke the Nazi code, Enigma. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, Turing came up with something called the Turing machine. That, responds to, that responded to instructions to solve a problem. Uh, and he did a test called the imitation game to see if a computer could actually imitate a human. Uh, a Dartmouth College computer scientist, John McCarthy, actually coined the term artificial intelligence. And then, you know, since that, we've seen robots, we've seen GPS, We've seen IBM come up with something called the deep blue computer that beat uh, a Russian uh, champ at chess. Mm -hmm. uh, we now see Siri. We have Alexa. We have self-driving cars. We have Elon Musk. <laughs> we have Sam Altman uh, with OpenAI. What would you say was the breakthrough that created AI? You know, for me, it was the internet. So Alan Turing, when he proposed the Turing test, that was before there were computers, which is pretty interesting. Like, can a computer do this? And computers were totally theoretical. When McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence, that was for a summer school. They thought they would just do AI that summer, and then they'd be done in September and go back to school. So it's turned out to be a lot harder than that. We've been working on it as a field since then, but the the real leap that we saw in the capabilities was in the early 2000s when everything sort of shifted online. You know, you'd had the web around for almost 10 years. All this data suddenly starts coming online with social media, with these transactions, everything digitally being up there. And it took us from having a thousand examples that we could build AI on to millions of examples that we could build it on. And it just leapt us forward in terms of the progress. So everything we see now has been sort of incremental, but you see these big leaps. And, and for me, that was the big one that has pushed everything that's come since. Ethan? So, uh, there, I mean, 
I think that is absolutely the start of everything, right, is this data set. Part of this was that there's really two forms of AI, and we were alluding to this earlier. If you had a conversation about AI two years ago in a setting like this, we'd be talking about using machines for prediction. So there was lots of controversy over using AI to do sentencing or figure out what your financial risk would be and the bias in those kind of systems. And those systems were really good at predicting the next number in a sequence of numbers, but they couldn't predict the next word in a sentence because the next word was, if the word was filed, they didn't know it was filing your taxes or filing your nails. So there was a breakdown in 2017 of a new type of AI called the Transform with Attention Mechanism that let AI pay attention to the entire word, sentence, paragraph, page, and thus produce good language. So that's been kind of kicking around forever since then. And then when ChatGPT came out at the end of November in 2022, um, it was, much to everyone's surprise, it turned out when you build a system large enough with enough data in the way you were saying, using this new mechanism, suddenly you have this thing that, unlike previous models that can make predictions but didn't feel like working with a person, suddenly you have this thing that can do human language really well. And it is human language so well that it almost seems like it's working or thinking independently. And that, that I think, was the breakthrough, was that chat GPT, GPT 3.5 that came out a year and a half ago. Mike? So for me, uh, probably slightly different. Remember, the internet was created by the DOD initially. It became in the late 60s. The World Wide Web was created in 92. So look, the, all those things that happened literally decades ago. To me, two things came together. Number one, data available at levels and amounts we had never expected or seen before. And entire business models built around the idea that data generates monetary value, generates positive. So we created these architectures designed to to create these massive data concentrations. And then secondly, to me, it's a societal one. We as a society became much more comfortable with the idea of going to machine and asking it important questions that we then based our decisions on. When we travel anywhere, we ask an app, what's the best route? We don't do any other, we just execute it. You do something with your bank. It said I did the following things, okay, good, my account must be fine. Those two things to me, we just got used to the idea we should be comfortable with machine generated recommendations, so to speak. And the fact that there was now all these masses of data, that to me is what comes together in the last five years or so to kick this up to a whole new yeah. level. Anish? Well, just to build on that, there was a, a few <coughs> technical <coughs> uh, uh, additions to this, which is the hardware, the boxes, the machines that would be used to actually process. Um, and there was a breakthrough in how computers would process information. So in today's machines that we have at our homes, uh, they kind of run these questions through on a local basis, and the speed and the amount of uh, machine throughput you would need to go through the entire internet was just orders of magnitude. You couldn't stack all the home computers in the world and say, okay, now I've got all of this, now go produce a, a, a prediction engine. So we did see the creation of this new hardware chip, uh, a GPU, that did allow for a different way of processing information at scale. And so what you're seeing today, the new miners in the equivalent in California here, the, the new picks and shovels of this era, um, the NVIDIA chips have been a key foundational capability on which the, a lot of this technology and data could be applied. So there's all these factors come into play, which brings out this exciting moment of November of 2022. So uh, when we, when you talk about chat GPT, which, it, I mean, that really kind of brings it to the person who's got a computer or a cell phone, I guess, really. Uh, and that's based on LLMs. I mean, I've done my research here. Yeah, right, it's perfect. Do you see the way he just threw that out? Like, hey, I've known that all my life. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, LLMs, I didn't know what the hell that was. So. These are large language models that have literally billions, if not trillions, of parameters. What are parameters? I information? Uh, well, like uh, a I'll, variable. Yeah. Huh? Like a variable. Okay. So they've got these variables, uh, and it has the ability to basically tell you what the next word is and the next word after that. Uh, so that has kind of brought it to, you know, a lot of individuals uh, to be able to use that uh, either to do essays or to do things that, uh, that can basically write up uh, whatever material. What are, the, what are the benefits and the dangers of chat G GPT? 
Okay, so um, that is a very large question, <laughs> and we're still learning the answer, but I'll give you a little sample of each, okay? So um, one story I, 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 I think illustrates this. I teach uh, MBAs and undergraduates at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, this time I decided to teach them how to use ChatGPT in my entrepreneurship class. The assignment was that they had to figure out a way to replace their job. So when they went to a job interview, they would hand the AI prompt, the GPT, over to, their, to the potential employer and say, my job is now done, please give me a raise, okay? I had students who ranged from military uh, pilots to lots and lots of thwart and lots and lots of private equity and banking people, um, you know, hip hop producers, and 300 of them, or 250 of them designed these GPTs to do this. And four or five of them got jobs that week. Um, all of them figured out ways to automate large parts of their job just after three hours of experience. So the fact is that this does a lot of work. We similarly find, we've done some experiments that for um, Boston Consulting Group, a very high-end consulting company, that we saw a 40% improvement in performance, in quality of performance, when people were allowed to use ChatGPT without any training. So very, very large positive effects on performance in real-world job tasks. So that's a really exciting thing. Um, and you know, similarly, on the downside, um, all my students are now using it to write all their essays, um, so that's not great. Um, and there's a lot of similar things like essay writing that was important, that people, writing mattered, right? Writing was how you showed that you thought. Writing was how you showed that, uh, that you put care into something. And now I can push a button and get writing. And I think that's gonna be, have big impacts across a lot of what we do. And I don't think that's necessarily the worst impact, but I think it's probably one of the more subtle big ones that people aren't ready for, is like, what does it mean when words are cheap and easy to produce for anyone? I think that's gonna be an interesting challenge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me ask you because I, you know, it, it, I, reading the Washington, or not the Washington, but the Wall Street Journal periodically, uh, they've got a company named Nvidia. Uh, a lot of shareholders in the room. There you go. <laughs> okay. Little smiles right. on the face. Recommend the stock. <laughs> uh, and Nvidia has become the third most valuable U.S. company with a market value above $2 trillion. And what do they do? They sell chips to, for AI. Why is there only one company that has designed these chips? Well, we were having this conversation in, in general terms. Uh, when a lot of what happens in, in markets is serendipity. So a chip that was built to make it easier for your kids or yourselves to play video games because people wanted to have that kind of action experience uh, to feel like you know, the, the graphics were moving at a faster pace than what we may interact with on, on a static television show. That customer market led them to invest in something that maybe didn't have a lot of, not had a couple competitors, but they were kind of a market leader in. It turned out the reuse of that same chip was critical to unlocking some of these capabilities in terms of predicting uh, the next word or implementing these large language models. So you have a company that has had a head start, well managed, and it is building the infrastructure at a time when literally almost every data center we know. When you guys drive through any uh, community that has a data center, a big room of boxes of computers and servers, those are going to be upgraded with these new chips. So there's a pretty big market of companies, and it turns out already People have been ordering these chips in anticipation. There will be more competition, but at the moment, they've got a little bit of a head start. The second and third uh, tier company are bringing their products to market and will be picking up uh, the slack. But the overall demand for these chips went from a very small niche gaming industry to every data center in the world is going to want to have these chips. So they've been able to grow into a, a, bigger, a bigger market. We did invest in this country in the CHIPS Act, and we'll get into that perhaps a little bit later, uh, in part because we wanted to have the capacity in the U.S. to design and manufacture the building blocks of a digital economy. And so we do believe some of the research and development investments that will come from the CHIPS Act will help us think of even the next version or next generation. So this is an area where we'll see continued investment and competition. So, so the fear that I've heard is, is this an economic bubble? In other words, something that's going to blow and people are going to start losing a lot of money. Uh, is that a danger here? Uh, so, I mean, I think that it's, so I think we, we have a disagreement among the panel here, but I think this is the real <laughs> deal, okay, with um, AI overall. 
Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not in bubbles, right? Will Nvi NVIDIA hold its, its, its value? I don't think so. I don't know. Maybe it will in the long term. I'm not making investment advice. Please don't, don't play more <laughs> than, um, I, Not in the finance department, so don't, don't tell Jeremy Siegel. Um, but um, what I would say, though, is if this is a kickoff to a general purpose technology and all the sort of evidence is, these are these generational changes like computing or steam power or electrification, then uh, it, we're not really in a bubble. There'll be lots of little local bubbles, but we're, in, we're in really in a generational change. And that's what I'm betting on, but you know, no one knows the future on this front. Right, right. But I, I think what'll change over time is, look, at the moment, companies labeling their work as somehow AI associated or AI driven, they view as a differentiator that will resonate with the buying public. I suspect over time that kind of hype is going to diminish yeah, significantly yeah. from the way it is now. All right, let's, let's, let, let's get to the question of the day. Can AI ultimately replicate human behavior? <laughs> uh, for the older generation here, including myself, uh, the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, brought us a computer named Hal. And Hal basically ran a spaceship, but also possessed qualities of human beings like fear and jealousy and ultimately wound up murdering the crew on the ship. <laughs> minor is, mistake, minor mistake. <laughs> is Hal possible today? And I say that because, uh, you know, I was looking, looking through this and a guy named Robert Marks, who's a professor at Baylor, uh, does not believe that we can produce hell. And, and I'll give you a quote. Computers can add 23 and 13, but they don't understand what 23 and 13 are. Creativity and consciousness and sentience are not computable. Computers of tomorrow will use the same sort of, al sort of algorithms that we use now. Are we going to see AI be able to take on human behavior? I think AI can definitely imitate human behavior, but is it the same thing as the question? So an example that we talked about before, if we go back to Alan Turing, I, this is the most I've talked about him in a long time. Um, so when Alan Turing came up with the Turing test, this imitation game, the question was basically, if, if I'm behind a wall and you're trying to assess if I'm a human or a computer, you'll pass me a note and I'll pass something back out, and is it a human or a computer that answered it? So with ChatGPT, like, we've passed the Turing test. You can't tell if you're, you can't differentiate it from a human or not. But one of the critiques of the Turing test, you know, 40 years ago, was if you pass me a message in Chinese, and I don't speak Chinese, but I have a dictionary, I can translate it into English, and I can write down my answer, I can translate it back with the dictionary and pass it out, and it, that would make it seem like I'm intelligent in Chinese, but I don't understand a thing, single thing about what's going on. And so am I really intelligent? Am I replicating intelligence of someone who's fluent in Chinese? I would say no, and we may have a little disagreement on this. I mean, we kind of agree, and we, you know, I think you hype it a little bit. But uh, <laughs> what I would say is this is, and I am a computer scientist. My PhD is in computer science. But I think this highlights a critically important thing as we move forward with AI, which is we need the involvement of the humanities and the social sciences because they have deep, long histories of thought on these questions that are really going to inform how we handle this technology. And, and I love my people, but you don't want to leave it to us scientists to make decisions about like humanity we don't have like the best track record when we're just left to our own on that as a social scientist i'm happy to take um no um so i i don't think we disagree on the nature of it being kind of an imitation right but i have been threatened by the ai on a number of occasions um and you know so uh, I felt it personally, but I, I think part of what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, interested in is the practical effects, right? And so we know in a practical setting, for example, I have a, a colleagues who teach a famous innovation class at Wharton, um, and that lots of uh, class gets venture cap capital funding for their ideas. They have the students in the class generate 200 ideas. They, using the techniques they taught them over our entire class. They had uh, GPT-4 generate 200 ideas, and they had an outside panel of experts evaluate the ideas and their willingness to pay. They didn't know whether it was a computer or a human idea. Out of the top 40 ideas by willingness to pay, 
35 out of the 40 came from GPT-4, only five from the humans in the room. So I don't think it's actually thinking, right? At least I'm pretty sure it's not thinking. But it also does emulate characteristics of humans well enough that I don't know if there ends up being a functional difference. So I think it's kind of an open question for me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that, that we have not created a true artificial life, but when it fakes it well enough and actually practically does these things in the real world, that's troubling and a little, a little hard to know what to do with. What do you think, Mike? I mean, for me, look, there's two dimensions to this. There's a technical piece. Hey, will we be able to develop the engineering and the technology to actually execute it? I'm the first to admit, I, I'm not a scientist. I suspect we will get close if, if not able to achieve it. But the second component is a societal one. So even if we can technically develop it, are we as a society going to be comfortable with the actual implementation of that? And my gut tells me to believe we'll take a risk-based approach that says in some areas we, we are just not comfortable. I, I can remember in the United States Navy, 40 years ago, we actually using a reels-based system for our, at the time, brand new, most automated, which is still at sea today, our warfighting system, we could fully automate detection, tracking, and engagement, the whole thing without an individual. Now, it was a rule-based system. It said, if you see this, do that. If you see this, do that. We did it. I remember we did it. We showed that we could technically do it, and then we made the decision operationally. We were totally uncomfortable with not a, a man or woman involved in the decision loop to actually apply kinetic force against an entity with a man or woman potentially in it. And so we actually shut it down and said, while well, the capabilities there, we're not going to do this. And we never have 40 years later since we developed the technology. Anish? I might, let me, let me ask a question to the audience. Have any of you ever emailed your physician? Have we started to do that now with electronic health records, a good number of you? Uh, in the last 12 months, some of the leading uh, healthcare centers with one of the larger electronic health record companies has introduced the first response to the emails as having been written by the artificial intelligence. Now, it's ultimately reviewed by a clinician before it's submitted, but they've run some research, and they find that it's far more empathetic in its response. <laughs> Is that a comment on doctors or on AI? <laughs> so the reason I bring that up that's, is that that's, back to this that's idea. That's a terrible message to the doctors. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, in many ways, a re it's a reprieve for physicians because the inbox is one of the most difficult things to respond to because you got a day full of visiting your patients and you got to do all this other work in the background. So you may not be as uh, verbose on an email in response. And so what they found is that by doing the marriage, I think uh, you said it exactly the way we want to go, which is it's both the machine generates the initial draft, but it's ultimately the human that hits sub, you know, respond or submit or whatever the term is. And that, that term is human in the loop in, in the world of artificial intelligence, that it can be a better experience for everyone to be able to have that type of more explanatory response. It feels like it's empathy. So back to imitation. It is not a sentient being who feels for you if you've been diagnosed, unfortunately, with a terrible illness. It, however, has learned that, that when these words come in contact, this is typically the type of response that's, that's merited, and it has generated that uh, draft. And so we're seeing an environment where the imitation make you, makes you feel like it is as, as close to a, a, an empathetic uh, a partner. But the need for the human in the loop ensures that there is, there's no way that it will order your medications uh, on behalf of the doctor without actually communicating. That's, that's not happening. We, we know that uh, human beings have hallucinations. Some people in powerful places. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are we talking yeah. personal experience here, yeah. sir? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm also finding out that there are hallucinations in this area as well. Uh, I think it was a Manhattan judge who fined two lawyers <laughs> who were using a chat GPT to search for cases to support their, uh, their case. And uh, the cases turned out to be fake. Uh, now, there was this uh, incident with Google, uh, which may not be exactly a hallucination, but they released Gemini, which is their, their effort to try to get into the business. And what they did was because they fed a lot of diversity information into it to try to eliminate some of the biases, I assume. But when, when you asked for a picture of the Pope, it turned out to be an Asian woman. 
And when you asked about George Washington, he came out black. Uh, how can you stop the creation of these kinds of mistakes and phony media and ultimately what can turn out to be political disinformation uh, in the use of this uh, AI. And is there a way to label AI generated material so that the public is aware of where it's coming from? You just asked like 20 PhD dissertation <laughs> levels worth of questions. Let's go. Ready? I'm, I'm ready. Maybe I'll start. All right, yeah, you can hit three or four of them first. Yeah. Um, so, so we get this AI hallucination, which is a technical term and is great, when AI just like makes stuff up. And we get that from generative tools like ChatGPT, because our technical term, and I've been told I'm allowed to say this, um, is that they're automated bullshit generators. Like they don't care about what they generate, if it's true or not. They just are putting words together that sound human. And like if I were to tell you that the whole world will be destroyed unless you write me a legal brief in the next 10 minutes, you all could fake it. And you'd make up case names and do all that, and it would look fine. And that's all the ChatGPT actually does. I mean, it ends up being right a lot of the time, but it doesn't care about being right. So can we fix that? Like, sort of. Um, we have all of this AI from before these LLMs, large language models, which you know a lot about. Um, <laughs> that work on knowledge representation. So we actually, you know, it, um, we had IBM play Jeopardy, right? And it did well. Right. And I, had, I have colleagues who worked on that and they were building like representations of actual human knowledge. You could put that AI together with something like ChatGPT and potentially cut down on this. So that's, that's sort of, but we can't make it all go away. In terms of labeling it, you can talk about the regulation side of that. I think what we're gonna see in that space, whether it's images, misinformation, text, is something like we saw with spam in the early 2000s where we are working, there's a lot of people working on building detectors. Was this AI generated or human? And of course there's a gray middle area. And then the AI is gonna get better and the detectors are gonna get better and we're just gonna keep fighting that battle until somebody wins. We won with spam, I don't know if we win with AI text generation, but we're working on it. I mean, that's a really active space now. You want to take a couple? Yeah, that was great. Uh, so I don't disagree with the automated BS generation, but I, I do want to emphasize the other piece, which is it's right a startlingly large amount of the time, more than humans in many cases. And as the models get better, hallucination rates have dropped, not to zero by any stretch, but I used to assign in my class that they could use ChatGPT on anything, but they were responsible for the output, and I would always carefully uh, be able to figure out what who was lying and who wasn't, right? But GPT-4 is better than my students in accuracy. So, you know, it's better than many doctors. So there's sort of an open question about can we end hallucination or do we just use the standard of I call BAH, best available human. Is it better than the human you have access to? So there's a lot of interesting debate there. I think on the misinformation front, um, I think that ultimately this is going to be undetectable. I think the internet is uh, going to be completely full of made up garbage if it isn't already. Um, you could already buy, I found out yesterday, a biography of me that was completely AI generated. It, um, not a single word in it is true, but it's 208 pages that uh, <laughs> seem accurate or not. And so Amazon's already Feels filled good. with all of this stuff. Yeah, it's not bad. It says, my love for music is famous. I, 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 when I play music, people around me run screaming. Um, but um, so I think we're going to fill this information. I could already create a give me 30 seconds of someone in video and 30 seconds of their voice, and I can make an avatar say anything in any language in their voice, um, and that's commercially available. So I think we're at the tip of the iceberg on some of these problems. But it, it is interesting where we, where we are in this journey. This technical effort to replicate human intelligence has managed to replicate a full spectrum of that human intelligence <laughs> from knowledge, reasoning, insight and creativity to falsehoods, biases right. and hallucinations. So far we've actually managed to get the whole spectrum of human <laughs> yeah. behavior in this thing. <laughs> well, to, to bring this home though, it comes down to what's the framework for accountability? How do we make sure that if someone is propagating any of this information, it's in the context of something that we either purchase and expect to work, or we hope will follow some rules, and that if it doesn't, we'll have some accountability. The comment I made earlier about the generated uh, messages from the doctor, about uh, 30 or 40 health systems, we worked to get a commitments uh, document organized with the Biden administration in December to say, we're gonna pledge to work together to identify some of these uh, hallucinations and other factors and address them through areas like watermarking. So University of California at San Diego, one of the signatories, 
the message now reads, this message was automatically generated and reviewed by your clinician. So you have that transparency as a patient when you see that uh, come together. So accountable systems will understand that it's an input to a set of other factors that when put together may result in a better product. And that is the area where I think there's a lot of excitement. It's not to say that, oh, it hallucinated, therefore, please put this back in the shelf never to see it again. We will, and we'll get to that tonight, talk about all the benefits and promises that this technology can bring to our economy, to our quality of life. And if you want the positives, we need accountable systems that take some of the outputs, combine it with other processes that make it so that it minimizes any harm to you and maximizes the benefit to you, us. And I think that's where we're heading, accountability for the outcomes uh, that incorporate some of these models, more so than trying to sort of say this particular model lies 2.3% of the time and this one is at 34 so somehow one is bad and one is good. But I, I, if I could, I think it also shows you, look, there's no one solution to this. Mm -hmm. It isn't gonna just be technical, it isn't just gonna be regulatory or policy, it isn't just gonna be the government, it isn't just gonna be the private sector that's developing it. And there is a huge role here for us as individuals. Given this current state of development of technology, for example, we have got to stop believing everything we see is automatically accurate. I mean, we have just got to realize we're living in a different world today. We, we need yeah. to put our own filters in place here over and above what technology is providing to well, us. Well, that's right. We went wrong with social media <laughs> because we basically allowed it to Right. We to said, well, if we see and hear it, it must be accurate. Yeah. Well, uh, let me uh, bring this uh, first part of the uh, of the of the lecture to, with with a, a light question here. Uh, <laughs> will AI influence the balance of power <laughs> in the world? <laughs> uh, Mustafa Suleiman, who uh, wrote the book The Coming Wave, says that over the next ten years, AI will be the greatest force amplifier in history, and that it could enable a redistribution of power on a historic scale. Uh, some scholars compare the development of AI to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, are these, are the fears about where AI can take us, I mean, is, is it justified? I mean, I think it will be a significant dimension and a significant impact on a, a nation's power or advantage, if you will, over time, because it is, it is so ubiquitous economic, informational, medical, the military. It just has such broad applications and it will generate such potential advantage. And the flip side is when used against an entity, it, it has the ability to create significant disadvantage. So I do believe that this will be a disruptive, game-changing kind of technology. Mm. I'm still positive about it, but I do acknowledge that. Well, I was gonna, we'll come back to this example of how it does the, on the elections, but let me just state uh, at, the, at, the, at the foundation of this, the, we don't make great decisions. And that could be on a lack of information or uh, a misunderstanding as to whether or not, uh, or the friction of, of making a better decision is exceeding what we think that we're gonna get out of it. But if you, make, if you took a string and said, what are the 10 decisions we made of, of, of late? What did I buy that I shouldn't have? Or what, what did I not buy that would have made my life better? Um, you could imagine a world where if I had a better aid, a personal assistant that had access to my information and could guide me, it could steer me towards making better decisions. Um, at MIT, where, where Ethan was uh, on, on faculty or a professor, uh, they had proposed to DARPA, uh, the research R&D arm of the military, uh, back in the 90s for something called the Guardian Angel Project. And the idea was basically that, a digital guardian angel that could connect to your data feeds and help guide you through every step of your journey. And the good of that is that if we could get the decision support to make the right decisions, uh, you know how we choose the wrong line to get on when you're trying to pay some, you're on a queue to pay for something and all the other lines go faster because you picked the wrong line? This could assist us, and I'm giving that as an example, but you could imagine a, a scenario where it assists us in a lot of decisions. The flip of that is that if someone was trying to manipulate a decision you have in front of you, like where to cast your ballot or for, for whom to cast a ballot, it could just as easily manipulate and guide you towards a, an alternative decision. 
And so in, a, in the context of social media, one of the biggest concerns for this election cycle is that it'll be the first election cycle where we're gonna have all of these capabilities being brought to bear. And we'll have a, we're gonna witness it together, the amount of uh, disinformation on social media that's meant to spark outrage that may have been generated uh, purposefully to direct us uh, off, of, off of our objectives. And that is the concern people have in that the decision support is just what it is, a decision support. Someone can tune it towards the advantage or tune it towards something that's not so great for us. And that's where we're gonna see as a society how we're gonna uh, basically hold accountable those types of information systems uh, before they give us too much harm. On banking, the financial markets, and the uh, election cycle are where I think we have the most concern that we're gonna have a, a bit of a shock to the system uh, expected in the next several years. That's the worry. Okay, uh, we're at that break point, and what I'd like to do is to take a moment to recognize our question review team. This is, these are the people who select the questions that are presented to our speakers, and I'd ask you to please hold your applause while I introduce the entire group. Uh, they are David Kellogg, who's the managing editor of Monterey Herald, Pam Marino, who's a reporter with Monterey County Weekly, and Doug McKnight, who's a reporter with KZU Radio. If you would thank them. For me. And Sylvia and I would again like to thank uh, the Panetta Institute Board of Directors and all of the lecture series sponsors that make these programs possible and allow us to bring these very important discussions with all of you to our audience, to you at home, and to their students across the Central and Northern California area. We had a great student program uh, today as well that uh, allowed the speakers to interact with students from all of the schools, the Navy Postgraduate School and others uh, in the area. So please, if you would give our sponsors a hand as well. Mike, let's uh, start with you on uh, national security. Uh, you know, the, the concern obviously is uh, autonomous warfare. Uh, and uh, the possibility that we could have a hyper war, I think it's called a hyper war, uh, where suddenly these various autonomous weapons, drones, et cetera, et cetera, basically are conducting warfare and pretty much operating on their own. Uh, what, is, what is the threat to national security and what are the benefits of AI national security. So is that scenario possible? Yes, from a technical perspective. As I've said, uh, there are capabilities out there today where you can apply force uh, without man intervention, uh, and you can do it at scale, huge numbers, huge volume. Um, but, uh, you know, the U.S. interpretation right now is, hey, the law of armed conflict specifically prohibits that application of military force indiscriminately and without a, a human decision in the loop. Also, the, the democracies of the world have broadly argued that the application of force in the end should be something that is controlled, or at least by some measure, by a human. It shouldn't be done autonomously. I don't see that changing. It is interesting. In, in my previous life as a military individual, lots of discussion about, well, what do the Russians and the Chinese think about this? What's their view? How are they looking at using it? If you look at I spent a lot of time reading Chinese military stuff in my professional life. Um, they don't seem to be overly concerned about those particular dimensions of its application. They generally speak about effectiveness, how this might support the state. You, you see this playing out, for example, in the idea of safe cities where one person's surveillance technology is an implement of stability and safety. And from another perspective, it's you know big brother and you want to take away my ability for privacy and to have a life without control and oversight by government. Look, AI is going to have huge implications for national security. It will both pro provide advantage, but it's also going to present a challenge in how the world deals with this. There's multiple efforts underway right now in the world to attempt to come up with some measure of global standards or a global framework for the application of AI. Um, 
it just hasn't gone anywhere yet. I think that's a measure of we're relatively new and everybody's trying to figure this out. We're not, we're not really well defined on the national security side yet, I don't think. Uh, we know that China has basically said they want to be dominant in yep. AI by 2030. Uh, how do you assess the readiness of the United States to be able to defend against the adversarial use of AI? Look, they've got challenges from a defensive standpoint just like we do. The advantage we have going for us, I always thought, is number one, I would still say we're a center of innovation compared to many others in, in the world, which is why you still see the best development work in AI here in the United States. I'm not gonna agree it's the only, but arguably it's the, it's the best and it is the greatest scale. It's also interesting, one of our advantages, I would argue, in the United States has been our ability to take technology and monetize it to then make it available at scale broadly and particularly at a price point that entities can afford, whether an entity is a government or it's a private consumer. China clearly is trying to contest that model. We'll see how this all plays out. I would still bet on us as of right now, but I'd be the first to admit um, we need to pay a lot of attention, a lot of attention. Okay, uh, well, a question along the same lines, but it deals with something else called quantum computing. Uh, first, I, uh, for the sake of the audience, if you could define what quantum computing is, I'd appreciate it. But what do you think are going to be the effects of quantum computing in terms of uh, our ability to be able to defend our country uh, with regards to uh, AI? And uh, I mean, my understanding is quantum computing can virtually break any code yeah. you have in terms of... Uh, so let's first know. talk about where we are on the journey on quantum and where we're <laughs> going to be. And I'll yeah. tell you exactly what I've had President Trump ask me this, I had President Obama ask me this, I had Congress ask me this, where I would constantly get, Admiral, you know, you, you and the government, you're asking for literally hundreds of billions of dollars on this. Could you help us understand this and what does it mean? So first, what's the difference between quantum computing and traditional computing that's available today? Computing today is inherently limited in the sense that the byte, the fundamental building block of computers, can only process two variables and only looks at one state at a time. What makes quantum the game changer that it potentially will be, quantum enables you to look at multiple variables simultaneously. So what does that mean? Think about problem sets, lots of data, lots of variables, and high rates of change. So what are things like that? Cancer research weather, commercial encryption. Those are all kind of data sets where those quantum attributes suddenly become really positive for you. And where we are right now in the journey, because uh, I, I do multiple quantum work with companies in my current life now, we're still in the early stages, but the thought is sometime within the next five, 10 years, we will have managed to build enough qubits or the building blocks of a quantum computer as opposed to the to the bit or byte of a traditional computer, will have been able to create a quantum computer with enough processing capability that will be able to power through commercial encryption. Now, I worried about that as the director of NSA and the commander of Cyber Command because commercial encryption was probably the foundational element of our cybersecurity ecosystem. It's not the only component, but arguably it's probably the foundation. The idea that current encryption cannot be broken through traditional computational capability. And what would the implications be if you developed a computer system that in fact could power through it and suddenly you're able to access all this data that's currently protected. So that's why the view is, hey, quantum is a potential game changer because it takes us to a whole different level. There's debate about the timelines, but it's something, boy, the government, the commercial world, private industry, China, it's one of the top 10 technologies. You mentioned AI. Quantum is another technology that the Chinese government has argued is foundational to economic and national security advantage in the digital economy of the 21st century. Big deal. Yeah. It's a big deal. <laughs> uh, and it's another one of the races that's going on in technology yeah, right now as to who, who's able to get there first. Uh, are jobs gonna go away with uh, AI? Uh, Great interview uh, by Sam Altman re recently, and I'm quoting from him, jobs are definitely going to go away, full stop. <laughs> uh, 
is is he right or you know or or are we going to be able like we have with every other invention that threatened jobs ultimately find new jobs that we are going to be able to provide to people Ethan so when you think about jobs, the way we think about them in sort of economics is jobs are bundles of tasks. They're sets of stuff that you do. So I'm a professor. My job is partially coming to places like this and talking, partially teaching, but also research, but also filling out expense reports, right? If the AI fills out my expense reports for me, my job has changed, but has not gotten worse. So what traditionally happens when new technology comes along is your bundle of tasks in your job changes, but the job remains the same, right? Or, or it doesn't remain the same changes as well, but it doesn't necessarily go away. So when accountants, when spreadsheets came out, that completely changed what accountants did. They focused on higher end tasks than they did when they had to do math all day long. That said, right, so the expectation is that when we, when we survey people after they use AI, by the way, they all report being anxious because they realize it could take their job and happy because they just gave it the worst parts of their job. So if we manage this well, and one of the things I think that's a theme that we all agree with is we have some agency or control over this. If we manage this well, this can be very freeing. We give up the most annoying parts of our jobs to computers to concentrate the stuff we're good at, which also probably is the things we're still better than AI at and that ends up being pretty great. And every previous technological revolution has resulted in more jobs in the end. The caveats I would give you is this time could be different. We've never had automation aimed at white collar work this way before, right? The people who are most disrupted are journalists and professors like me and customer service agents and salespeople. Normally that is not a job set under threat, so we don't really know what happens. And the second warning is that living through one of these technological changes can actually be quite rough, right? It's what happened after the Industrial Revolution, amazing. During it, lots of unrest as jobs change and people change what they did with their lives. So I think we don't have 100% answers. I think the consensus view is that this helps jobs in the long run, makes our jobs more meaningful and better. But the short term could be much more difficult than if Sam Altman succeeds in his goal of building a machine god that's smarter than a human, all bets are off. So I think that's the other question. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I so I, I completely agree with that. Um, there are some jobs that like probably won't be around, but um, like capitalism says we're all gonna have jobs. You know, otherwise, like, like, what's the alternative? Like, mass unemployment and poverty, and then the machines are just generating money for a small number of people. I mean, I guess that's a possibility. I don't even go that dystopian, and I'm the worrier among the panel. Um, I think it's much more that, like, people are going to find new stuff to do, including managing this AI, including being the human in the loop with this AI, which means a lot of people are going to have to learn a lot of new stuff, but we've done that with the internet and we did that with computers and we've done that with lots of things and I think that's where we come out at the end. New stuff. Yeah, well, but just, I mean, to be <laughs> pragmatic about this, uh, at the moment we're blessed with an economy where there are a lot of job openings and people are not here to fill them. So there is actually an interesting dynamic where the productivity gains that we're gonna see will actually still benefit society as a whole because we're basically gonna be helping uh, organizations that have had a hard time growing on account of inability to recruit to do their jobs, uh, to get their products out and to be successful in what they do. The pragmatic reality is that the, what makes this moment different is the barrier to turn on an AI capability in your organization is literally a swipe of the credit card and a minute later you're ready to go. Whereas prior to the democratization of these technologies, if you wanted to have nice things, you had to like spend a lot of money building a lot of technology to pull all your data together, train your models, and then deploy them, which is why they were very, very hard to get access to. Uh, now, it's, it's pretty accessible for all of us, and the, the, that's the one part that is giving people some anxiety in terms of the impact on what does that mean to my, my daily work. And so, hopefully, uh, organizations will start to prepare individuals to find the next value-added thing to do with your time when you save on expense reports. And that's, I think, the conversation that many of the, of the organizations in the white-collar se white sector are preparing for. And technology as an employment or business disruptor is not a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. This is true when we developed the printing press. It's true when we developed the steam engine. There's a series of major inventions over time that have been economically disruptive to the status quo in which they were introduced. But we've managed to work our way through it. I suspect it'll be the same with this, but it will be disruptive. Uh, healthcare, your area. In the healthcare field, how far away are we from no longer needing 
human primary care providers <laughs> and how much bigger, let's see, I can't read this word, uh, how much longer before we don't need specialists? Yeah. Well, this is a great uh, moment uh, to see the benefits of this for the healthcare system. As I was alluding to earlier, we don't have enough of those of us who are in need of healthcare going through the proper uh, set of protocols, meaning we're not necessarily getting checkups when we are feeling healthy but have an underlying health concern that may be uh, worrisome and if we uncovered it early enough could get better. The U.S. government today is funding projects around the world. Like in the Philippines, uh, there are remote islands. The Philippines make up a lot of these small islands that don't have fit primary care clinics. So that question you pose is not about replacing a primary care doctor with an AI. It's a place that has none having something that can provide what we'll call primary care-like triage. That is where we are at the moment. You can get pretty good primary care triage for places that don't have anything. You would not uh, uh, stop visiting your primary care doctor today because there's now an, uh, an AI doctor available, but the presumption is over the next five years, and I think that is more like five, a lot of the things that happen in between our visits where we, you know, you get sick, you call the doctor, then you say what's happening and you make a plan. A lot more is gonna happen that's called that primary care in between the kind of visits we've had so far. You wanna check in, text message, hey, did you grab your blood pressure? How are things going? The biggest uh, public health issue in our country today remains heart attacks, hypertension. A lot, there are about a million heart attacks a year we could eliminate if we just did a better job monitoring our blood pressure, taking the very cheap aspirin, keeping us healthy until we hit that, uh, if we don't do those things, we, we get up in the emergency room and we have a heart attack. So if you think of primary care as more broadly, someone that we could rely on to be our nudge to keep us healthy, or maybe to check in on us from time to time, that will happen over the next five years, for sure. And specialists are gonna be doing their job for quite some time, but they're gonna be supplementing their support with these uh, AI tools to do part of the job. If I could just, if you don't mind, a real quick chime in at the end of that. I think this is one of those places where if we hit on the kind of social aspect of this in addition to the technical, because the technical capabilities of AI and medicine are really transformatively impressive. And you think about what you're talking about. Uh, so I'm a hypochondriac. I have a therapist. He's great. He's helping me with it. Uh, <laughs> I go to the doctor all the time. Uh, but I know a lot of people who are whatever they're, I mean, they actually are hypochondriacs, but in the reverse, like they refuse to go to the doctor because it like stresses them out to talk to the doctor and it would not stress them out to talk to the AI doctor, right? And then we have these services online now, right? There's all kinds of medicine. You can go online, you pay your $75 and there's like some doctor in the background somewhere and they like mail you your pills where you could easily imagine an AI physician physician that's as accurate as the ones there just checking what you filled in on the form and get people who are not accessing medical care access to it, which is sort of this in-between space of, you know, the remote island that doesn't have someone and here where we have plenty and people aren't going, right? Ethan, yes. there's uh, several questions about the role in education. Uh, basically, the concern is, can AI eliminate inequities in education today? So it's a great question, all right? So um, I'm very passionate about how do we democratize access to education. I've been spending 10 years building games and simulations to do this at scale. Uh, very elaborate, Wharton's put in lots of money into them. I have a team of 14 people. We started building these simulations, I think a year to build, and then we found out that we can type one paragraph into ChatGPT, and it basically works like a simulator that would take us a year to build. So that was like a kind of a mind blowing moment. Um, the, the holy grail in education is one-on-one -on -one tutoring. There's a very famous, probably not quite replicable paper called Bloom's Two Sigma paper that found in the 1980s that if you uh, give someone one-on-one -on -one tutoring, they improve by two standard deviations. They go for the 50th percentile performance, 98th percentile. Now, 1980s social science is full of, of mistakes and lies, but uh, <laughs> the actual number might be less, but it's still very effective. And tutoring is very expensive. Even if you have money, it's hard to find a good tutor. The early evidence we have is that AI makes a really good tutor. 
different because it personalizes to you, even though it makes mistakes, it makes less than many human tutors do, and then there's a process to go through. And so one of the most exciting things is this idea that we can do this. So if you have kids or grandkids, you may want to try using um, Khan Academy's um, Conmigo, which is one of the early tutors, as plus and minus is not perfect, but it's a pretty amazing thing. I know when I'm helping my students, my uh, kids with their homework, I am checking the but, you know, so I look smart, I'm like just checking the work on, on ChatGPT first and be like, yeah, this is how uh, cell mitosis works. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in that, and the value is that it's also universally available. So we have some early studies out of Ghana that show that math tutors, actually uh, AI math tutors significantly increase math performance on tests. So we're in the very early days. I think it's important to realize this is not about replacing teachers. This is about supplementing. This is about that the worst way to teach is for me to give a lecture to all of you. Uh, please keep coming to Wharton so we, we get a salary. But the worst way to do this is to do a lecture. Interactive learning is a much better way to learn, but it's very hard to do. AI might unlock that. So I think there's a lot of potential. We are at the beginning of this, sort of like we were with quantum computing. I don't want to leap ahead, but the early signs are really, really good. Yeah, I How mean, do you I, feel? Uh, you uh, <laughs> I do teach, um, and I do a lot of lecturing, actually. So, um, yeah. So, so I think this is a thing where, like, we sort of agree on the promise of what this can offer. But this kind of comes back, my thoughts come back to a question you had asked before about, you know, is AI going to lead to a shift in global power? And, you know, the answer is, of course, yes to all of these questions. But, like, does it go the good way or does it go a bad way really depends on what people do with it and, and you know, who has it for what purposes. So if we're talking about like individual tutors, like this is a great idea. If everybody can just get an AI tutor that's like perfect for them and gonna speak to their level and explain everything. And the question then practically is like, how do you do that? And so if I'm a company and I'm providing that tool and it's like, okay, here's a kid and I'm gonna provide a tool to this kid and I'm gonna collect all of this data like as they're learning, like what, what am I gonna do with that data? Right? Like, how much of a privacy invasion is this? How, how much am I collecting on that? How much does that get sent out? How am I going to monetize it? And, and I think that's the thing where I spend so much time thinking about, like, how is this going to be misused? Because I am a social media AI researcher, and, like, man, like, you guys think it's bad, but it's, like, so much worse than you think it is. Like, <laughs> how much you're being surveilled and how much, like, really, truly evil stuff is going on behind the scenes along with some good stuff. So I think about teaching and like of course like technologically there's great stuff that can be done and I don't disagree that it will be done but I really worry about especially when there's like a profit motivation behind this which there has to be what are all of the bad things that are also going to happen back there and that's a big question mark and I think that's why we kind of agree on a lot of this tech you're very excited about the stuff it's going to do and I'm like you're right and I'm so worried about all the bad stuff that's going to go on behind the scenes I would just have one thing I, I think again this is agency so I've been working in build, you know with nonprofit support building simulations at scale Right, and looking at government support and things like that, where the whole idea is to bake that in from the beginning. So we're not ignoring the issues of data privacy or concerns about students. And you know, like that's something that I think if we don't do this, I keep getting sent for-profit companies. They're like, we built a tutor. It's like terrible and it's invasive. So I think we we could we could take charge of these things, and th there are ways of doing this that we have been developing that keep this in nonprofit hands and government hands, you know, in, in the hands of school districts and students that encode things properly. So I think that that has to be part of the, the, you know, the excitement. I think the fear sometimes holds us back from trying to do something valuable. So that, that would be the balancing act. You've just, you've just heard an expression of the hopes and fears <laughs> of AI, uh, because that's what it is. I mean, you know, then that's, that's what we're debating here today. Transportation. Uh, autonomous vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, drone systems, all are using advanced technological capabilities. Uh, is that the future of transportation and is the technology safe? Mike? I mean, I, you see an interesting, uh, you see multiple approaches right now in transportation for AI. You see one scheme that says the answer to this is put all like autonomous vehicles into a separate flow so it's just autonomous vehicles. They're not dealing with the man. You see another what Elon Musk is doing now where he's arguing if you study the performance attributes of the best drivers, you can then use that as the basis 
for creating an AI-driven autonomous model that in fact will generate better performance, if you will, than the average human conveyed vehicle. It's interesting to me, so two very different models. One argues, hey, double down, build the whole system around it. The other argues, little risk, let's, let's do it in a bifurcated kind of way. If I was a betting man, I think in the long run, the Musk approach in terms of an integrated transportation system in which a, autonomy is a core characteristic, I suspect personally that's where we're going because it gives you scale, efficiency, and that's what the economic model is going to drive us to. Uh, that would be my guess. Okay. Uh, let's turn to the question of regulation. Uh, does the federal government have to regulate uh, what uh, AI is doing and will do? Uh, how can policy be proactive in protecting us from AI threats while also promoting AI's blessings? Well, I mean, this is an area where I find uh, a great deal of active debate and a wonderful set of opportunities. The short answer to the question is yes, we will be regulating this capability. It's inevitable. But the practical manner in which we do so is up for debate. Here's my take on where we are on regulation. Uh, you can't get away with the, my dog ate my homework. So <laughs> if you are already regulated as a bank, just because you happen to use AI to run your banking operations doesn't mean you can say, oh, I didn't mean to discriminate in the mortgage application. I didn't, it was the AI that did it, not me. Uh, the regulators for each of the departments that have already consumer product uh, safety uh, responsibilities, they will have to communicate how they will incorporate AI-related uh, use in the pursuit of the industries in which they're already regulated. And we're starting to see the Food and Drug Administration, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau already make very clear statements that the laws on the books are the laws on the books, and it's the outcome we're regulating. And if you happen to use humans and a combination of AI to get there, we're going to hold you accountable for the results, and you've got to figure it out. That's one path, which is that we're going to regulate, uh, as we already have, these different uh, uh, parts of our, our economy. The one unregulated part of the economy remains the social media part, the part that is the digital communications channel, where we're going to see a lot of the disinformation concern play out in the 24 election cycle. And at the moment, our regulation is written to be the following. We're protecting social media companies from any lawsuits or liability based on the content that flows through their sites. That was the deal. In return, they were supposed to act in good faith to take steps to make the platforms basically uh, safe for customers to use. The latter hasn't really happened all that much. Now, we've seen fits and starts where they've tried to do their own individual things to keep the content uh, safe or maybe to have content moderation rules to, to minimize uh, some of that disinformation, but it's not anywhere near what needs to happen. So the big question on regulate AI is really the fundamental question what do we do with social media? And I do believe we're going to have to do something to reform the way we operate what is called Section 230, the part of the law that gave them this uh, uh, kind of liability protection. If that happens, then I think a big chunk of the AI risk is mitigated because the existing industry regulations plus the social media will give us a bit of a level playing field. The alternative view is that we need a single AI agency to rule them all, like we created the Federal Communications Commission to handle telephones and broadband. Uh, it's not talking about healthcare use of broadband or healthcare use of telephones, it's just telephones. So in that context, there's been an argument we should have an AI agency. I don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. I don't know if it necessarily is a good idea to have it because so much of what AI is is about performing the function like uh, Food and Drug Administration's review would be about the you know, food safety when it's incorporated or, or medical support. So my hope right now is that we'll tweak all the existing rules to be precise about what we can do in a more agile way. And we rely on industry engagement in the meantime to give us that more uh, iterative uh, behavior. So if I want to watermark an image on my social media platform, how do we make that something that others can replicate and be held accountable to monitoring 
if we figure out a way to do that in the short run. If I could, there's Go three ahead. things here that I think are Mike. really interesting from a regulatory perspective. First, this is the only technology that I can remember in my lifetime where developers largely from the very beginning said, you know, federal government, you need to regulate. You just don't hear this from technologists very often. But for this technology, for whatever reason, from its very beginnings as it started to scale, you've heard this almost universal developer call to government, you've got to help regulate this. Secondly, broadly the public, if you look at the polling data, the public in America broadly accepts the premise, some question about what's the best way to do it, but broadly accepts the premise, hey, there needs to be a strong regulatory or oversight dimension to this that the government should play. The third thing I find really interesting is, so a technology that few people truly understand that the government really is not the leader in its development, we're now gonna turn to a government to say, so something you don't understand that you have little direct knowledge and experience in, <laughs> come up with a regulatory regime for, for us. I, I just, if you watch any of the testimony, for example, on the Hill, listening to some of our congressional leaders, I'm thinking, do you understand the basics of the business model here, the technology, and clearly it's, it doesn't mean they're bad people, but expecting them, you, you have talked about this before. I, yeah. I think that's really challenging for us. Yeah, no, I think the biggest problem is that most of the members of Congress don't know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, you know, there are gonna be a few who'll know this subject and know the implications, but when you have to pass it through uh, the Congress, you know, 435 on the House side, 100 on the Senate side, you're gonna be running into people that have absolutely no idea of the implications of what's going on. Let me, uh, let me ask each of you, uh, you know, and in, 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 we're, we're into almost the last five minutes. Um, what, give me your sense right now, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of AI? I mean, we've talked a lot about the areas uh, that's involved. We've talked about, obviously, some of the good things and some of the bad things, but I, I guess just standing back, how do, you, how do you feel about where we're going with AI in this country? Oh, I'm, I'm extraordinarily optimistic because I want us to be a productivity engine. I want this country to be stronger in the next 50 years economically than it was the past 50. And I think the communities that have embraced this technology for the greatest good will be the winners of that next phase of our economic growth. So I'm pretty bullish and actually I want, like when President Biden asked the AI companies to self-regulate, a little bit of the, uh, Mike, a little bit of the short run step of yeah, yeah. you guys get your act together and then self-regulate. Yeah. He also said, by the way, the cancer moonshot's important to me personally, please put your, br your brain power to work on that. So there's a, no there's a moment here to say, I want everyone to have an AI tutor. I want everyone to have access to healthcare in a new and creative way. And so the question is really, how do we maximize the chances of the good in this era of productivity gains while mitigating uh, the risks and the harms? And if we can strike that balance on net, I think we're gonna see a very impactful uh, impact to the economy, but also to our quality of life. Generally. <laughs> Positives <laughs> and challenges. Okay, Positives, challenges. I'm the one who builds AI up here, right? So, I mean, I obviously do that because I think there is a ton of promise, but I also see how much power there is in it, and I reflect back on what's now 15-ish years of AI fueling social media. So a lot of my work is on AI and social media in personal data, and I see systems that on one hand have made profoundly positive changes in society. You look at, say, the Ferguson protests and Twitter, and it was this profound change in who's allowed to control the narrative, who's allowed to share information. Like, that's, that's great, and that's, that's a combination of AI and this technology. But I have also seen, you know, from the inside, on lawsuits I've worked at, from things on the regulatory side, this tremendous power concentrated in the hands of profit-making entities that has driven people towards absolutely undeniable evidence, uh, greater levels of depression, greater levels of self-harm, um, all kinds of psychological issues, especially in kids that, that come out of this. 
and companies that know that that's happening and companies that don't change their artificial intelligence to fix that. Mm. And that kind of thing, and that's not the only thing, you guys. There's a lot of bad stuff going on out there. And, and if you're, it's making money, what we have seen consistently for 15 years is we know it's making money and we know it is profoundly damaging to people or society or democracy, and it does not change. And so my real worry is not that we're not gonna live up to all of the great visions that I think everybody up here has shared. I think we're, that is all technologically capable, but I think we are a little naive as a society about what really dramatic steps we're gonna have to take. And I don't know that that's big regulation necessary, but like, what are we gonna do to make sure this tremendous power is not serving You're worried about the challenge and whether we- Absolutely. Yeah. Ethan. Okay, so I'm generally optimistic. I'm, appreci I'm appreciative of the clapping for the negative. I mean, don't want to contradict the negative. Uh, I'm going to go with a different dimension, entirely good or bad. I'm going to say weird. I think things are going to get very weird uh, in lots of different ways. Um, and um, because we are used to a world where there's mechanical abilities that we do. I, my favorite example is if I tell you you have to dig a ditch in your backyard, you don't get your 20 stoutest friends together to dig a ditch. You hire a backhoe, right? There was no alternative to hiring a bunch of minds if you needed people to think. Now there is, in some form or another. And those minds are weird, and they're not actually thinking, and they make stuff up all the time, and they're run by for-profit companies, but also released around the world as, as open source solutions. And they can imitate our voices and our emotions, and but they don't think, things are going to get very strange. They're already getting strange. Um, and I think there's a lot of positives here, there's a lot of negatives, but I think that we are in for a very unusual period in history that very few of us have lived through before in this kind of way of rapid technological change, lots of strange stuff happening all at once, it's already starting to occur. So I think I'm very positive and optimistic. I think the warnings are well taken. And the last thing I wanna say is we have agency over this stuff. So every warning that you hear is completely real. And if we're not taking action on them, they will all come true maybe alongside all the positive stuff, and it's gonna be an interesting time. Um, for me, I'm an optimist by nature, so overall I'm very optimistic, but I have two specific concerns. Um, first is an observation. I have never seen a technology in my lifetime go so quickly from the technical world to society as a whole. This is the only technology, except for the, the, the these handheld the digital devices that we call phones, but really are not phones, they're handheld digital devices, that's the only other thing in my lifetime that I can think of that has just had such a broad impact across society. I've never had a technology before where my 85-year-old father asked me about this. Michael, what do you think about this? My children asked me about this. Hey, Dad, what about? That brings me two concerns. Number one, this will have a high rate of change, and bureaucracies and societies don't always execute well with high rates of change. It's gonna challenge us and it'll be disruptive in some ways. And then secondly, I worry about the authoritarian states who don't wanna regulate in the sense that they, they tend to focus on the, the positives from the perspective of the state and not the impact of the individual and the ability to use this as a competitive tool against us. That is the second worry for me personally. Well, thank, thanks to all of you for uh for addressing uh, this very powerful issue. I think, you know, I think all of us have to take hope in what is our democracy, that ultimately it isn't about the machine. It's about the human element and the quality of leadership that we have in a democracy. Uh, and as I often say to our students, in a democracy, we govern either by leadership or crisis. And if leadership is there, we can avoid crisis. But if it's not there, we'll govern by crisis. And so the real test of whether or not we can deal with this challenge is whether or not we have strong leadership in this country that abides by the values and the things that we feel are important to human dignity and to saving the democracy that all of us cherish. Uh, I think this is a moment in time when we have to make the right decision about the future leadership of our country. Anyway, thank you all for being here and thanks to our group.